Um, let's, uh, let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to dive right in. I wanna read the first 11 verses of this chapter. This will kind of set the context for where we're gonna go today. A very familiar story for those of you that grew up in church or that you're familiar with the Bible. But if you're not, that's okay. You are, you are in the right spot, and I believe God's gonna speak something to each of us today. It says this, 1 Samuel chapter 17, the Philistines now mustered their army for battle and camped between Soka and Juna and Azekiah and Ephesadeim. And say that 10 times. Hello. Saul countered by gathering his Israelite troops near the Valley of Elah. So the Philistines and Israelites faced each other on, on opposite hills with the valley between them. Do you see the picture? Do you get it? Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield. Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight, he called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. Jesus, we thank you for your word, and we just pray that over the next few moments, you would minister to each of us in a profound way. God, we recognize that we may not be facing a nine-foot-tall giant, but there are circumstances and situations in our lives that feel like Giants. So today, Lord, would you just teach us how to battle, how to slay these giants? What does it look like, God? How do we, how do we continue to move forward the mission that you've called us to move forward in the midst of opposition? In Jesus' name, if you believe it, say amen in this place. So the first 11 verses kind of set up kind of what's going on here in this particular section of scripture. We are in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 17, uh, the Israelites in this particular story are God's team. The Philistines are the enemy's team. And uh, we know that God's mission and purpose for the Israelites were, were to um, have his favor shine upon them. He promised that he would go before them and help them conquer their enemies so that those that they conquered and the neighboring nations would know that he is the one true God, Yahweh. That was the mission, really to make him known. What's our mission? To make him known. Do you see the parallels? Now, when I read the Bible, um, obviously this is the context of what's going on, but I also see it uh, through my own experiences. And when I was reading this story, because I kind of want us to like visually get where they were at for a moment. So you can picture it, there's this valley and they're standing on opposite sides of one another. And this took me back to 2009 when the Iowa State Cyclones rolled into Memorial Stadium. <laughs> yeah, I'm going there. <laughs> so we roll in and, and we, I mean, I'm just telling you, we hadn't won in Memorial Stadium in 31 years. Some of y'all are laughing and smiling and like that's the only thing you can celebrate from that day, I'm just saying. <laughs> so we roll into this game and we're on one side, the Huskers are on the other side and I look across the field and I see this guy by the name of Nadamakan Sue. <laughs> he wasn't nine feet tall but his arms were the size of my thighs. I thought to myself, I'm so glad I'm on defense, I don't have to block that guy. <laughs> I started to think, man, like when I was reading this text, like thank goodness in football, it's a team sport. 
Because if it was mano e mano, like, hey, Nandama can sue 50-yard line and you guys got to pick somebody, Cyclones would have walked out of there with a big fat L. <laughs> and I'm sure, like, this is what the Israelites are thinking here. I mean, think about this. Nine foot nine. I was sitting in the backyard the other day praying, reading my word, and my son Judah came out. and He said, hey, Dad, what are you reading about? I said, man, I'm reading the story of David and Goliath. Oh, he's like, man, the giant, he was so tall. Like, how tall was he again? I said, well, scholars think nine foot nine. I'm like, do you know how big that is? And there's a 10 foot basketball hoop in our neighbor's yard and I pointed to it and I'm like, dude, can you imagine a dude about that size rolling down the street or standing across from you? I mean, come on, I know we all love stories of these heroic, like, you know, David and Goliath, like, yes, like, Oh, Rudy Rudiker from Notre Dame and like, who loves Little Giants? I watched Little Giants in the last week and I'm like, yeah. I mean, the best part of the movie is that dude with the goggles, you know, when I think Spike looks at him, he's like, I'm gonna take your head off. And he's like. (laughs) But isn't there, there's something about these stories of like the underdog. We just, it's like pulls on our heartstrings because there's something so inspiring about their faith, their belief, and their courage. I think God put that on the inside of us. And I I think it's just a picture of us that when we see people walking in that, we're like, yeah, like, I think there's some of that in me too. I think I got a little fight in me too. And so we see this this is what's happening in this Story, man, the Israelites, they're, they're freaking out. They're scared. And this goes on for 40 days. This Philistine comes out. He's taunting them. And they're intimidated. And they're full of fear. And they're run, running in the opposite direction. They forgot that God said that he would conquer their enemies. But they're running in fear. What's interesting is when you start to study the word 40 excuse me, the number 40, it means a season of testing, trial, and probation. I found that kind of interesting. So it's almost like the Israelites here in this, this season of trial, this season of testing. Do you find yourself in that place today, potentially? Here's what I found about the giants that we face, and I'm gonna talk about a few here in a second. Because the most dangerous giants are the ones that we act like don't exist which to be honest is the greatest temptation in our particular culture that we find ourselves in. Why? Because we have so many things to numb ourselves. You know, we can just numb ourselves. I think of like all, all the various, I mean, issues have been around for, for ages. We're reading about it in the Bible. Like people have been making knucklehead decisions forever. But I just think we have access to so many things that, that cause us to, to numb us to the reality that there's really something going on. And so I wanna just bring a few to the surface and before I do this, I wanna say this. I'm not bringing these to the surface to shame anybody in this place today. If this is your giant, just know this much. You don't need to keep that thing into hiding. You don't, you don't need to feel shame. Today, we're gonna bring that thing into the light. We're gonna stare that giant in the face and we're gonna say, no more. No more. No more. We're bringing this to the light. I think, um, when, I think the first giant, as I was preparing for this message that I thought about, was like the marital giant. There, there's just this, I think marriages are under attack. Why? Because it's a picture of the covenant that God has with the church. The enemy, the easiest way to to mess up the next generation is to divide families. And let me just tell you, if that's happened in your life, man, God is a God of second chances and he can extend grace and mercy in your life and cause you to do it right the next time. But if you are in the fight right now for your family, come on somebody, it's time to rise up in this place today. Because you're gonna see in this text, this this battle that we find ourselves in isn't always just about us. So often we just think, man, this is about me. We just, we live in, we're inundated in our culture that everything's about me, myself, and I. 
I'm here to tell us that we've got to get ourselves caught up into the bigger story, the bigger prophetic continuum of what God is doing in his kingdom. Yes, we want you to experience God's best for your life, but God is doing something so much bigger than just OC. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than me. But it's bigger than us, but God wants you to play a part. He wants you to participate. The second giant that I think we're facing in culture is what I would like to call the mental health giant. 40% of adults in June of 2020 said that they are struggling with a mental health condition, and I believe that those numbers are only going up. And here's the reality is, um, if you've been struggling with that, there's no shame in this place. The enemy would love for you to just hide and act like that thing's not going on, but we need to bring that thing to the light. We need to ask God wisdom. It might be time to meet with a pastor. It might be time to meet with a counselor. It might be time to go see a doctor. But we've gotta bring that thing to the light. We've gotta, we've gotta say, this is a giant in my life. I'm not gonna just run the opposite way and act like it's not there any longer. Because you and I will never slay something that we don't call out and acknowledge that it's standing right in front of us. I think that the, the next giant that we face is lack of contentment, discontentment. And this is what is driving this insatiable greed that is in Western culture. It's never enough. I gotta have a bigger house. I gotta have another relationship, another car, more money. I just need more. Man, man, my wife's just not cutting it any longer, so I'll try this over here. That's, that's what drives infidelity. It's this discontentment. It's a giant. It's a giant. And the final giant that I wanna hit, there's probably other ones that I could hit, would be self-medication. I think that, and again, this comes back, I wanna bring it all the way back to where we started when it comes to numbing ourselves out. I think that, that, Addiction is the result of something so much deeper. It starts with just trying to cover up the pain, the shame, the this or that. And so what am I gonna do? It's just a lot easier to, to smoke a J or take a drug or drink something than it is to face that thing and deal with it in a healthy manner. And then you do that and then you need more and more and more to do it. And what next thing you know, you find yourself in a state of just being numb. How do I know that these are giants? Because 50% of marriages are ending in divorce. I just told you 40% of adults say that, um, that they struggle with some sort of mental health condition. They say that one in six children by the time they're 24 will struggle with a mental health condition. Check this statistic out. 47% of families say that pornography is a struggle in their home. 68% of men in the church say that they struggle with pornography. 50% of pastors, check this out, 76% of young adults 18 to 24 actively are struggling with pornography. I don't say this stuff to shame anybody in the room, but let's acknowledge our giant. Goliath's taunting us there's an adversary that has a plan for your life and it's to kill, steal, and destroy. And we gotta wake up and acknowledge that God doesn't just have a plan, the enemy does too. Now we know this much, that there's only one way that we are defeated in this fight. And it's number one, if we act like there isn't a giant. The second way is if we say that the giant is bigger than our God. So I'm in this place today to proclaim that if you and I are gonna face, fight, and defeat our giants, we need to get some confidence. Yes, I just made up a new word. <laughs> confidence, what is it? It's confidence not in myself, but in him. There's something powerful about order. And as I read this entire story of David and Goliath, it's what sets David apart. 
because we see him win a lot of battles on the outside, but where was the battle really won, Kevin? On the inside. We say it all the time. The secret place is the secret sauce. And so God is just, I'm just telling you, he's, he wants to go in to your heart today. And he wants to stir us up. He, 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 wants, to, he wants us to, to acknowledge some things that are going on. I, I want us to even just, what, what's percolating around, around your heart? What has invaded the privacy of your heart? What have you allowed into that place? Because you're going to see today that you don't have to fight this battle alone. See, David rolls up on the set. This is incredible. And it's like he brings an outside perspective. Because he wasn't there for 40 days when this Philistine steps up and is saying, yo, like taunting them. He comes to deliver uh, some bread and some cheese to his brothers. Like just being a faithful guy. And can I just tell you, this is after he was anointed king. It tells me something about his identity. It tells me something about his security. It's powerful and it's attractive and it's the secret sauce. And if you're a young person in here today, I wanna tell you something. This isn't part of the message. I don't know why I'm saying this, but it is better to be overdeveloped and underexposed than underdeveloped and overexposed. See, David, something was happening in private. God was preparing him in private so that he could release his power in public. But many of us want the shortcut. It's more about the stage and the platform than it is about our intimacy with God. Listen, that is a pathway to destruction. But the secret sauce for my man David is he understood the secret place. He understood that Man, when nobody was around, he was being developed. He understood that, man, I'm a bloom where I'm planted. He understood that the grass isn't always greener on the other side. It's green where I water it. I'm gonna be faithful. I'm gonna be a faithful shepherd boy, and I'm gonna take care of my father's field, and I'm gonna let my father teach me how to use a sling and a stone to take out the giants that come against my sheep. You know how I know he was surrendered and submitted? Because he was willing to be directed. Let me ask you a question. Are you the director of your life or are you being directed? I don't know about you, but as a man, I'm typically the one that hops in the car and I'm driving my family around. Every once in a while, my wife will hop in the driver's side and so then I get to sit in the passenger side and I'm like, this is a totally different experience. <laughs> I'm like, dang, I can just kind of check out. It's kind of nice not guiding and making the decisions and having to pay attention to the GPS and all the things. And I think some of us, we're so stressed out, we're so overwhelmed because we won't hop out of the driver's seat. There's something so powerful about being submitted and surrendered to our God and saying, yo, I don't need to take the wheel. You take the wheel. I'm going to trust you. And that's what David's doing. He's trusting his father. And he was directed to his brothers. And he shows up. And he shows up right on time. The Philistine steps up. He's taunting him. David's like, wait a second. Did I just, did I just, did he just defy my God? Oh, no. Um, how long have you guys been allowing this to go on? Every once in a while, we need a little outside perspective into our world <laughs> to get us back on track. Because I'll be honest, when I read this text, I want to be like David, but there's a lot of times where I relate to the Israelites. Can we just all be honest for a second? Can't we just been putting that thing off? We've been, you know, letting fear and intimidation and insecurity get the best of us. Oh, oh, we're gonna act like we don't struggle with that in church. No, we all do. And, and we put on this front. But God, God's not gonna bless the fake you. He wants to bless the real you. And there's some work that God wants to do today. There's some confidence that he wants to instill in us. And I think there are some principles from David's life. I could give you 15 today. I might only get to two like I did in the first encounter. But there are some things that y'all can learn if you zone in on what David figured out. You know what I love about where we're at in scripture as a church? Is we're not only going through 1 Samuel, but we're also going through the Psalms. 
It's like we see the battles that the warrior and the king wins, but we get a chance to look at his diary. It's real easy to preach David and Goliath from the stage. But there's something beautiful when you go and you read what he penned in the Psalms. It's the secret sauce. He understood how to, how, how, how to build relationship with Yahweh. He understood what, what intimacy meant. And, and here's the thing. Intimacy builds conviction. And when you have conviction, that leads to courage. Are you with me? When you have relationship with somebody, why do you think he was so disgruntled? Like, y'all are gonna let this happen? I remember one time, confession. Can I give you a confession? I was at Lifetime Fitness. This was back when the staff used to train together. And some dude came up and got in PT's like, face at Lifetime. And I remember, okay, so check this out. I'm friends with PT. I've got a great relationship with our pastor. I mean, he's my homie, he's my friend, he's my brother, he's, he's like Barnabas and Paul in my life. Like, I just, I'll lay down my life for this dude. So when I saw this, something rose up in me. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> I thought to myself, oh no, don't even try, because I don't want to go to jail and end up on the news. <laughs> this was like six years ago when I was a lot less mature, and I was, you know, more testosterone probably falling through, my, I, I don't know. But anyways... <laughs> I was ready to go. I wouldn't just do that for anybody, but I'll do that with him because I've got a personal relationship. Are, are you seeing the correlation here? David, he was so intimate with God that when an enemy was defying his God who he had deep intimacy with, it caused something in him to rise up. And so we wanna start changing culture Get in the presence of God. You want to get some conviction and courage to stand up against the adversary, against everything that's coming against us? Listen, keep, you know, do whatever God calls you to do. But I can tell you that shouting from the tower of social media and doing all these practical things, that's great. And if God's calling you to do that, do it. But get on your face in the presence of God. Because we can start making a change one family at a time, one relationship at a time, one neighborhood at a time, one community at a time, one school at a time. Come on, is anybody with me in the house of God? This is how we slay giants. And so if you see here in verse 32, gosh, that was a long opener. My goodness. Okay. 13 minutes, four points in 13 minutes. Let's see. Okay. Verse 32, I want you to see this. Principle number one, I think it's, it's so beautiful. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. So this is, he's asking all these questions, like, yo, what's going on? Uh, finally, it gets the attention of Saul. And Saul's like, I need to talk to this guy. So here's little old David talking to Saul. And here's Saul's response. Or excuse me, David says to Saul, I'll go fight him. I'll go fight him. Verse 33, Here's Saul's response. Is this what you want to hear? Don't be ridiculous. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy. and He's been a man of war since his youth. Principle number one is this. Godfidence says Yahweh when everyone else says Nahweh. Can I just move on? Do I need to say anything else? <laughs> I mean, the Israelites are no way, man. That, the giant's too scary. His brother Eliab had the audacity. His brother had the audacity to say, yo, why don't you just go back to the fields and take care of the sheep? And then you got Saul stepping up and saying, this is ridiculous. There's no way, and you're only a boy. Does this happen in your life? That's ridiculous. There's no way God's gonna do that. 
you're only a fill in the blank. Maybe it wasn't boy. But what was the label that was put on your life by somebody else? What sort of curse or pressure was put on your life by somebody else other than Yahweh? I love it because David here, he saw Goliath not as a threat too big to hit, but a target too big to miss. He had divine courage from the living God. And he said, I'll face this giant to prove that my God is a giant slayer. See, when you get divine courage, that's what I'm saying. This isn't just about you. The power of God is revealed and released through your life when you say, yes, Lord, I will fight this battle. And here we are, Eliab and Saul are trying to discourage him from stepping into this. And here's what I'm gonna say to you right now. I want you to write this down. I want you to think about this. But your courage will always be offensive to those stuck in fear. As a matter of fact, I'll say it this way. Faith will always seem ridiculous to those that are trusting in their own strength and in their own plan. So, hey, the question is, is why are we surprised when it's the people closest to us that are trying to discourage us from stepping into what God has for us? Don't fall victim or prey to their insecurity, lack of identity, and stinking thinking. You say, yes, Lord. Yahweh, when everybody else says there's no way, you say, my God will make a way. Hello. No, I'm not a rapper, but. <laughs> I remember in 2014, this happened in my life. I was married and we're gonna be celebrating eight years, come on, in August. <laughs> eight means the year of new beginnings. Um, so eight years ago, we get married in August. In November of 2014, so just a few short months after this, um, PT and I were meeting on Fridays. I was serving part-time at the church and also had a job selling medical devices for a company called Stryker, incredible company. And, um, and I showed up to this meeting and he said, yo, OC, like, I think it's time to pray about you coming on full-time staff. I'm thinking, well, number one, I never thought that I would be in ministry full time. You guys remember, I, I was like a jock that graduated with a marketing degree from Iowa State. I, I don't have no like theological doctrine, da 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 da. You're looking at a guy that's just been in his Bible for the last decade. Hey. So let that preach to somebody in here that doesn't have their theological degree. I'm, I love that PT was just agreeing with the Holy Spirit. And so. What did I do? Hey, babe. <laughs> um, so, uh, had a meeting with Pastor, and uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, I know things are going really good at Stryker, and I just got a promotion, but, um, <clears throat> um, and um, financial tra trajectory is gonna be completely different, but, <clears throat> um, uh, what do you think about stepping into full-time min ministry? And uh, by the grace of God, because I don't get everything right, but by the grace of God, my wife and I, I mean, I feel like I made the right decision and that I'm <laughs> stepping in what God has called me to do. But here's what I'll say. I had some people close to me that were like, you are ridiculous. You done lost your mind. What are you doing? You just got married. Like, what are you doing? I'm sharing this with you not to say, man, I've got it all figured out, I'm sweet. Let me just tell you, this is something that we all need to lean into in each season because each season brings new battles and new storms. But let me just tell you this much. It's preparation that's happening in each season when we acknowledge the presence of God in our lives in each season. It's almost like, there's this pattern that's being stacked up, this testimony that's being stacked up in your life because you never know what battle or storm is gonna come knocking on your door. And the question is, is do you have this trail of faithfulness in your life? Because that's what God was establishing in this season, that the best way is my way when everybody else says no way. See, God calls us to do unconventional things 
And so sometimes the thing that's in the mind or in the way between your freedom is your mind. It's you went to Google before you went to God. Hello. And um, but God, confidence says Yahweh when everybody else says no way. I want you to see the, the second principle here, verse 34. I told you we probably wouldn't get to everything. I mean, the keys are already going, so that's my sign to wrap it up. 34, but David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it again to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from the Philistines. So here's what I wanna tell you. Godfidence is developed in private before it's displayed in public. That's the principle that I pull out of this. Why? Because in a moment, where David is facing a battle and, and the Israelites are under so much pressure, David is testifying to a test of a past season. And I, I want this to speak to somebody in here because right now you can't wrap your mind around the thing that you're going through and you're like, why God? But I'm just telling you, your test will become your testimony. And God is building a pattern in your life. And the reason why David in this moment could face forward was because he was willing to look backward at God's faithfulness in his life. Come on, is anybody thankful for the faithfulness of God in their life? I don't think we do this enough, Adam. I don't think we do this enough, MJ. I don't think we look in our rear view mirror enough. Because we're always striving for more. We're not where we want to be. But if we would look back, we would realize we ain't where we used to be. God has done so much in our life. How can I not look ahead knowing that he is able? How can I not look ahead knowing that he will never leave me nor forsake me? That he won't fail me? That he will be with me even through the valley of the shadow of death? That's our good God. He's always doing something in each season. This wasn't mind over matter, but it was faith over unbelief. It was a posture that David had developed in lonely places, in the secret place, in the secret place. Anytime you see somebody slaying giants in public, just know that the secret sauce is what's happening in private. We were at a conference last month and uh, Carrie and Cody Carnes were doing a worship breakout. My wife was at the breakout, I wasn't there, and she was she was there and somebody asked questions about songwriting. Like, can we get some advice on songwriting? And I think everybody that was at this breakout was looking for like practical wisdom and strategy. And you know what Cody's response was, and my wife shared this with me, it's just been, I've been just thinking about this line for like weeks. He said, you wanna know the key to songwriting? you need to have a well-worn pathway into the presence of God. I was like, ah, oh, he gets it. Have you heard the phrase, real recognizes real? It's like, it's not rocket science. This isn't some secret code, but I'm just telling you right now, if you will commit to paving a pathway into the presence of God, all of a sudden, your problems and your giant get a lot smaller and your God gets a lot bigger. That's where your faith is built up. It's in the presence of God. It's developed in private before it's put on display in public. You're gonna see here, as you stand to your feet, we're gonna, we're gonna close out here. You can stand to your feet. I think of, as you read this text and you go through it, you see that finally Saul is like, yes, okay, you can go fight this battle. May the Lord be with you. And he tries to give him his armor. And because David is so secure and pleasing God more than he is 
interested in pleasing man, he recognizes that this armor just doesn't fit me too well. I remember one time I was at Lifetime Fitness and we were doing this running workout and I forgot my shoes. So I'm wearing, it's in the middle of winter. I've got these winter boots and I'm like on the, the, the treadmill like trying to do this workout because I'm, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay in the game. I'm not gonna tap, I'm not gonna leave. Like, let's do this thing. And this friend that came up the stairs that wasn't with us was like, yo, I've got some extra shoes. Do you wanna wear them? I'm like, sure. I put them on. I'm like, these don't feel right. My boots actually feel better than these running shoes. They weren't made for me. They were formed to his, to his feet. And in this moment, Saul's like, hey, go in my armor. And David's like, nah, I'm good. I'm just gonna pick up these five smooth stones and this sling. And here's what's beautiful is this recognition. And, and this is the principle that I wanna share here is that Godfidence fights with revelation, not regurgitation. What do I mean by this? Yeah, come on now, come on now. It's, it's this, God wants to give you revelation for your battle, not just what worked for MJ. And this is a word for leaders in this place today. Don't be lazy with the counsel that you give. Don't just always fall back on what worked for you or the last person that you met with. Ask the living God for wisdom on how he wants to fight this next battle. Revelation, not regurgitation. He's gonna bless the real you, not the fake you. And I just think, oh, this is what Godfidence looks like. This is what confidence looks like. And David is walking it out. He's like, no, nah, I'm good. I'll go with what my daddy trained me up in. That's a word for some dads in the place. Because you think that slinging stones was just something he learned on his own? No, Jesse taught him because he knew that he was gonna need to defend the sheep. So this is just a word for dads in this place. Know that what you're sowing into your children will reap benefits not just in the next generation, but generations to come. Come on, this is a bigger than us thing. This is a generational thing. And some of y'all are in the first generation of establishing a new path. Keep going, don't give up. And I wanna finish with this text because this is everything. This is, this, is the whole, this is the whole thing. Listen to this, David replied to the Philistine. He said, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today, today, listen to this, the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head, and then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel, and everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. Godfidence trusts in the Lord's strength instead of its own. While Goliath wouldn't shut up about his power, David wouldn't shut up about God's power. The roar produced by a strong walk with God will always drown out the roar of the enemy. Goliath trusts his armor, David trusts his God. Goliath's covering his fear, David's covering his faith. Goliath's covering his worldly, David's covering his heavenly. Goliath's universe is centered on himself, David's universe is centered on God. Exodus 14, 14 says this, the Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. This is what confidence is. David was putting his trust in the character of God. And so what happens? He slings a stone at Goliath and Goliath falls down and then David goes up, grabs his sword and slices his head off. Done. Giant slayed. And here's what I love most. In verse 52, then the men of Israel and Judah gave a what? A great shout of triumph and rushed after the Philistines. Ooh, the same people that are discouraging you from stepping in the thing that God has for you are gonna be the same people that are praising your God for the victory in your life. And guess what? Godfidence and courage is contagious. Ooh, because the rest of the Israelites started charging after the Philistines. And so I'm just believing in this place today that our greater than David, King Jesus, is going before you and I and slaying giants in 
the Spirit. Now here's the deal, it's gonna require participation. So you hear this message, you say, what do I do? There's some practical steps that some people in this place need to take. You need to delete some apps. You need to delete some phone numbers. You need to take that marijuana and flush it down the toilet. You, you need to go see a counselor, see a doctor, see a pastor. You, you need to not walk out of here today and say, man, that giant reared its ugly head, I'm gonna push that thing back down. No, we're gonna face it. We're gonna fight it and we're gonna defeat it in the name of Jesus. So God, I just lift up every single person in this room that's fighting a giant. And God, I pray that you would be their strong tower. God, that they would be reminded that you go before them, that you fight their battle on behalf of them. I pray they wouldn't trust in their own strength, but they would trust in your strength. I got, God, I pray that you would grant them confidence in this season. God, I pray that they would pave a pathway into your presence in these days, and they would recognize that the battle is won in the secret place and in private. And God, you wanna do something in private before you experience the victory in public. And so we just give it to you. Come on, in a sign of faith, just give him your battle, whatever it is. Re put your hand out and just release it to him. Release it to him. Release it to him in this place. We release every battle. We release it to you, God. We just say it has no more dominion or power over us in the mighty name of Jesus. Now there's another group of people in this place today that you walked into church and you're thinking, wow. Hmm, this Jesus thing, tell me more. Well, can I tell you there's a, there's a greater giant that faces humanity, it's a sin giant. And none of us are slaying the sin giant in our own strength. As a matter of fact, many of us has been duped to think that it's about good works, reading my Bible, going to church, doing a couple good things, and then God's gonna be good with me because I'm better than the person to my right or my left. I remember at 21 or two years old, I realized that the gospel isn't working our way towards God. The gospel is God left heaven, came to earth, lived the life that you and I couldn't to restore us back into right relationship with a holy God. As a matter of fact, with your father, before the foundation of the earth, the lamb was slain. God had your restoration and freedom in mind from the very jump. Let that sink in. But every single human's need is forgiveness. We need our sin covered. And the only one who could do that was the perfect son of God, Jesus Christ, who shed his blood on the cross so that you and I could live, not just now here on earth, but on into eternity. So don't get it twisted. I don't want anybody to leave this place today without hearing this. The only way to be made right with God is through surrender and receiving the perfect gift that he has given. So what will you do today? Will you receive it or will you reject it? Will you humble yourself or will you harden yourself? The invitation is clear. God's saying, I want you. <laughs> Don't go try to clean your life up. Don't be embarrassed. Every Christian believer in this place has done exactly what I'm inviting you to do right now. And so, I'm not even, the band's not even gonna sing. We're just, I'm just, just invitation. Right now, if the Spirit's prompting you, if the Spirit's moving in your heart right now and saying, yep, today is the day of salvation, today, yep, today is the day. Just make your way forward right now. It'll be my privilege to lead you in this prayer. Don't stay stuck in your seat. I, I know right now, oh, 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 what if, what if you make a mistake tomorrow? Oh, are you sure you don't have it together? God could never forgive you. Look at what you've done. Those are lies from the pit of hell. We cast those out of here in Jesus' name. You are chosen. You are accepted. You are loved. You are redeemed. Don't leave this place without receiving it. So if I'm speaking to you, make your way forward. I'm going to wait 15 seconds.
I'll tell you what, I'm gonna speak into this camera and I'm just gonna believe that anyone under the sound of my voice that is straight away, that, that has been running, today is the day that you realize God's been running after you. There's no mountain he won't climb up. There's no door he won't kick down. He is coming after you. And so if you're ready, say this prayer, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Today I'm choosing to turn and trust in what you did on the cross. Jesus, fill me and baptize me with the Holy Spirit. The same power that raised you from the grave, fill me with it and help me to trust you one day at a time as we continue to go on this journey of slaying giants and making your name known in Jesus' name. Come on, let's celebrate by faith. Proud of you. Church this week, fight your battles. Come on, let's lift up Jesus in this place.